Okay, good morning. My name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at the uh, Hills Nursery on a Saturday morning. And it's, this today's class is going to be on uh, growing apples and pears and our experiences with all the varieties that are out there. So, both apples and pears do need, do like to have a chill in the winter to get their flower buds and leaf buds out better but they do have a way around it. Both of them seem to have a way around that. So with uh, both apples and pears, uh, if they don't get their winter, they slowly wake up when it gets warm, like 80 degrees, it's 80 degrees for a while, they wake up, they bloom a bit, may not be their best bloom, uh, and then they make their crop. The, we have a lot of success with the apple. So, we read about in the 1990s that, you know, Rome Beauty apples are supposed to need a thousand hours of chill or from New York. And New York easily gets, you know, 1500 hours of chill in the winter time. Um, but they're growing them in the Philippines, in, in the mountains of the Philippines where the coldest it ever gets is 57. And they, so that's zero chill. But what they were doing in the Philippines is when they want them to bloom, they would strip off all the leaves and the plants would be bare for two weeks. And then because it was warm, they would initiate the next round of growth, which was, you know, first thing that happens is they bloom and they're starting the next crop. So they can essentially strip them any time of year when they had mature leaves on them and get them to bloom and make another crop, which took three or four months for the, the crop to ripen. And then they would strip it again. And so they wait two weeks after they harvested, strip them, and then they'd get another crop. So, um, so if it's warm and they've got buds ready to pop, then the absence of leaves, because leaves do inhibit the blooming and, and development of the buds, the absence of the leaves got them to come around and do it. So we found out that they actually do that here too now. The pro what problem we have is we don't get warm enough to wake them up that way until about May or June. So they're, they, so if you're in Oregon where they get the chill, they'll be awake in April. And here they wake up May or June. Now, most of the apples have no problem because the majority of apples that have that chill also ripen or harvested in the fall. Now, what we find is that if they have no chill, like, we get apples from up north where they get a thousand hours of chill every winter. And the year they get the chill, they wake up early and the fruit ripens right when the book says it's supposed to ripen. When we have them here, they wake up late and then they ripen a month or so later than the book says they're supposed. So Granny Smith is supposed to ripen October and um, Oregon here ripens November or a little bit later, because they wake up later. But because their falls aren't cold, they develop quite well. And we've seen quite a few times when in the middle of summer, if you have a drought shock, you drop a lot of leaves on your tree. And then right when you wash our water again, they start with a whole new fresh of flower, you know, whole new uh, thing of flowers. And then they make little fruits and our falls get too cold uh, that late in the year. So they, you know, around January, you can pick these little apples. They taste fine, but they didn't get any size because it was getting too cool in the fall, and our falls are getting too cool. So we can't do two crops here on most apples. There are a few apples that are, that we can, but uh, most apple trees, one good crop, one small crop. Now the problem we have with a lot of pears, so pears are still trying to figure out The problem with pears is they are supposed to be harvested in the summer. So a lot of the pears, like my dad grew barlet pears for 20 years. He got, he got fruit, but they're like this big. And that's because most pears ripen in the middle of summer. And if they bloom in early summer, right in the middle of summer, they don't have time to get any size. So a lot of the, most European pears aren't grown here. Uh, uh, we're not even sure a lot of them will bloom here at all. Uh, um, I mean, I grew Thomas here because some of the books said it'll grow here. Grew that thing for 30 years, got one 
two fruits on it. <laughs> so I'm going to, and you know, they were good sized fruit, but that's it. 30 years of growing them. So I got to figure, okay, the books are wrong. They do not grow in our zone. Uh, so we don't promote any of the true European pears. So uh, now last year we got first crop I can remember well of Asian pears, Japanese pears here at the nursery. And uh, we think it, you know, last year the chill wasn't going to exist. This year we were right around 400 hours of chill already. Last year we had right around 300 hours of chill, which is not, not supposed to be enough for the Asian or the Japanese apples. However, we had that early heat wave. You remember last year was 80 degrees in February, and then we had 100 degrees in early April. We think that woke the pears up because they thought it was already summer. And they had time to ripen, so we actually got a good crop of, of Japanese pears. Now, we'll see if that happens again this year, see what the weather does for us this year, see if it happens again. But for us this year, we think we actually have the chill for the Japanese pear trees. So we'll see what, you know, we'll have to see. You know, we might take a few years to figure out what happened last year. So anyway, when apples and pears grow, now, a couple things to know about them. Apples and pears are the most have the most tolerant roots of of the fruit trees we grow so if you use the wrong soil like if you use compost in the ground uh doesn't seem to bother them that much um, i remember our customers used to plant their pear trees in pure 100 percent redwood compost and they would do fine um, so the roots of apples and pears Need about the lowest, require the, about the lowest amount of oxygen soil of any plant we know of. The book says pear trees are the lowest, need the lowest amount of oxygen. Um, so they don't root rot easily and the compost doesn't seem to bother. Now we have heard of one case where the uh, pear orchard sued the waters because they they gave them um, water from a sewage treatment plant that hadn't been aerated. So the oxygen content of that water, you know, when you have sewage in the water, the oxygen content drops pretty much to zero. If it's not aerated, you're going to uh, kill the pear trees. And they just flood irrigated the fields, killed the entire orchard because the oxygen level of the water was too low. So it's, it can be done. But uh, very unlikely that you'll lose a pear tree to have them in the wrong type of soil. Now, uh, of course, we promote our top pot, which essentially has no compost in it, so that they will do much better. But apparently, you know, in the past, we've grown them in compost soils, and it hasn't seemed to bother them too much. They're, they're really good about uh, not needing that much oxygen. And apple trees, just about as good as pear trees. The other thing about apples and pears is that they're, they heal wounds really well. Apple trees are supposed to be the best tree known among all trees at repairing wounds. So, and what's interesting, you know, they're in the rose family, that the peaches and nectarines are considered the very worst tree at repairing wounds, same family. So peach orchards, you know, if you're pruning your peach tree a lot, they say 13 years should be the longest you keep a peach orchard in operation. Whereas apple orchards, there are many that are 150 years old. So. so what's interesting too is 100 years, well, 150 years ago, apples were the most important crop in the U.S. Because at that time, and in Europe too, because at that time, there was no good water you could drink. You know, the, they didn't have water districts that would take your water and make sure there was no disease in there. So in those days, everybody drank hard apple cider because it was disease fruit. I mean, it was full of alcohol. <laughs> so it was interesting. They said up until the 1600s, there wasn't, you know, there weren't, weren't that many, what, colleges and and uh, research institutions and all that because 
you're everyone was drunk all the time. <laughs> and in the 1600s, coffee and tea were introduced to Europe and, and the Americas. And they said at that time is when people got smarter because they weren't drunk all the time. So they had something they can drink, coffee or tea, that was not disease laden. No one had thought about boiling water and just drinking boiled water. Or maybe it didn't taste good. But when they brought coffee and tea over, then people can start thinking and writing books and doing all kinds of stuff. So that, that's, but apples, you know, everyone used to have to grow apples to make that cider that they can drink. I mean, they said they said, you know, kids drink the cider too, from morning to night. So it would be interesting to see what people were like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So planting them not not too critical. They can take really poor drainage. They the apples especially need a lot of water. So if your ground looks dry at all, they're not happy. They sit. You know, I have a book written in Oregon by an Oregon apple farmer. He says, I don't know how they can grow apples in California. You need soil that's five foot deep. You know, water the soil is wet five foot deep. It's what they like to make sure in Oregon and they get the rain, we don't. But, you know, just keep the soil looking moist, cover with the deep mulch, keep it looking moist and you're fine. Um, most of the apples we have in the pears, all the pears we have are just one variety. Um, but we do have some multi-grafted apple trees uh, that have I think all of them have four different kinds of apples on them. That's not usually the best way to buy apples or any fruit tree, but uh, that's better if they're on their own trunk. It's when they're grafted onto another tree, like the apples. The golden delicious type apple is the one that takes all the other grafts. So if you buy a multi-grafted apple tree, it's the golden delicious or the golden delicious type, dorset gold, and there's another golden delicious type. That is the tree. And then all the other apples are hanging on it for, you know, trying to survive on that tree. So, uh, and on, you know, if you get a citrus multigraph, it's the lemon. They use a the lemon and all the other drafts on there are hanging on for dear life. Now, apples and pears commercially are often grown on trellises. It's spelled like this. So one of the reasons they do that, well, they're finding out again that fruit trees, the smaller you can keep them, the less width you have, the more sunlight gets in there and the more productive the tree is. And certainly a uh, apple grown on a fence gets sunlight all around it. Uh, um, and, you, and you're quite a bit, you're quite productive when you, when you do it that way. Plus, the other thing about apples is they're very heavy. So if you have a branch, you know, a young branch with apples on it, it just gets pulled straight down. So supported on a fence, less maintenance. You don't have to worry about the branches just collapsing down on you. So a lot of the apple orchards are done this way. Actually, not quite this way. So uh, our supplier, Dave Wilson, I, I don't believe they do these themselves. They contract with their nursery in Oregon to do this. But what they've done is they've taken an apple rootstock trunk. So this is M7 apple. It's an apple that was discovered in England that makes good roots, semi-dwarfing, and they graft six branches onto it at the spot where they wanted to grow. Kind of cheating, but it only takes a mirror to do this. The only thing about this tree is it's pretty short. You put this in the ground, you lose a foot off of it. It's really low. Uh, we had another grower who went out of business that was that was actually training their apple trees into a spalier fashion. They weren't grafting them, but they had them at, the, you know, this is three foot, two foot, one foot. They had them at five foot, three and a half foot, and two feet, which was more realistic. But they went out of business, so. Do they grow them on supports or are they putting them against walls in the orchards? Just on a wire and stake. Wire. Right. Okay. If they, they put them some... on a wall, wouldn't you get less chill because the wall would keep the heat out of them? Mm, depends which way the wall is facing. But you only get sun on one side, so yeah. 
in the orchards. They just they probably run them north and south so they get equal sun on both sides. Or technically, they run them slightly to the east of north because <laughs> the west side gets hotter than the east side unless you do that. So we also have a few um, espalier apples left out there. They have six different apples wrapped on an each on each tree. So. Okay, so planting wise, you know, basically you dig a hole in the ground, drop them in. If you have clay soil, they love wet clay. They love any soil that's wet. So uh, soil quality doesn't matter on these. Um, but keeping them wet is important. Pears can go drier. They grow pears a lot in the deserts, uh, but apples, they certainly like it wet. Now in containers, we can use our top pot. Apples are a little set more sensitive than pears to the heat generated in black plastic, but it has, it's not that bad. I would say if you're in black plastic on asphalt or concrete, then that might be a little hot. But uh, here at the nursery, uh, this nursery doesn't seem to affect them as bad. At our previous store, we had them on in black plastic pots sitting on black plastic on ground cover cloth, and that seemed to make them look a little cooked. So they're not as happy that way. So watch the, the soil temperature on. Okay, so both apple pears have one nasty problem. So they heal wounds really well. So, uh, so that's not a problem, but they can get this one disease that's really nasty called fire blight. It's a bacterial disease that's spread by bees. So you need bees to pollinate, but sometimes the bees get fire blight. Now, it's a real interesting disease. I don't know how you know this disease came up with this, but so it's a bacterial infection. When if they, this tree had a bacterial infection on it, a fire blight, the stem would look like it's burnt. They call it fire blight because it looks like it's just charcoal, you know, it's dark gray. And at this point, it would be shriveled up uh, and look dead. But if the rain hits it, and certainly the rain was here this year to hit it, it would soak that area. And then the diseased area that's dead would exude this stuff with its spores that looks like honey. So the bees would see that and then we just land on it and check it out. And then they'd go to pollinate your flowers and the disease gets into the flower. So generally both pear flowers and apple flowers, the buds are pink, they open white. And then normally they, if they're dying naturally, they would turn either cream or tan, light tan, and uh, that's healthy. But if they get fire blight, if the bee brought fire blight to the flower, the petals would immediately turn gray and shrivel up almost black and you go, okay, fire blight in there. If you don't treat it, you know, if this flower bud here got fire blight, it would start turning black and just go like gangrene down the stem. And on a small tree, young tree, you can wipe out the whole tree. On older trees, it just kind of dies back to a major stem and then stops. But fire blight is usually the way all pear trees eventually die. Apple trees sometimes. So sometimes they're more susceptible and some apples than pears are less susceptible. Yes. Right, it's nice and bright. The branch looks cracked and black. And you snip it off, but make sure whenever you cut your branch that you dip your shears in at least 10% bleach. Can, you can spread that disease to your whole tree if you keep snipping, snipping with with some of that residue on there. So uh, now the other way to treat them is with a product called Garden Fox. Now a lot of orchards will use antibiotics, but you know we don't get antibiotics that easily from our pharmacy for trees. So we use garden floss. And this is um, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. So in many states of the United States, this is not labeled as a fungicide. It's registered as a fertilizer because it's potassium and phosphorus. But the phosphorus is the important part 
if you really load up these plants with phosphorus, they seem to be able to fight off diseases really well. So something about the phosphorus is doing the trick. Now phosphorus in plants and animals is an energy transfer molecule. You've taken biochemistry, it's ADP and ATP. Adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate are the energy transferring molecules. I don't know if it's through that mode or some other mode that it's curing the diseases, but what they'll have you do is right before it blooms or right when it's dormant, you make you make a concoction of this this half and half of water and spray the trunk and the lower branches and it absorbs it. If you spray that high concentration of leaves, it'll burn leaves and flowers up. So if it's already in bloom, they have you make a more diluted version, spray everything. And that seems to stop the disease that the breed, the bees bring it stops the disease. Now I grew apples and pears for like 20 years before I saw fire blight. So you may never see it, you know, you just snap them off. Now, uh, 96 was the first year I saw it. Because 95 was an El Nino year, and the 96 was a dry year, but apparently there was a lot of fire blight from there before. So almost all my apple trees in my yard, I had about 12 at the time, were showing the black flowers and dying back. I had a gale apple. Now, gale apple is the most susceptible apple tree known to fire blight, and all the branches are going black. I mean, it was only about a three or four year old tree. And you can see if I didn't stop this, it would kill the entire tree. So I just, cut well below the infected parts, cut it off two feet above the ground. And that stopped it. And then, you know, of course, I lost the crop for that year, but it grew back to the same size that 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 summer. So it came back just fine, but I knew if I hadn't cut that, it wouldn't have uh, lived. Now, my neighbor's tree next door to my house, Granny Smith, that's the most fine light resistant tree I've ever seen. He didn't treat his at all, and he had very little damage on his Granny Smith apple. So certain apples are, are very uh, resistant to certain diseases. Now, the Granny Smith apple is highly susceptible to autoimmunity, but that's not a killing thing. So, anyway. I had fire blight my tree for years. I've been fighting it. Okay. But, um, it still has leaves. So if I were to take the garden phosphate and spray the whole thing, would the leaves go away so it would go dormant and strip the tree? That's true. It would strip it the tree for you. <laughs> so, so right now, would I use a diluted amount of the garden phos or no, use, you. Or use the half and half? Half and half would but not go very far. Would no, it? well. <laughs> but if you use the half and half, just use it on the trunk part? The trunk and lower branches is what okay. the book says. Or okay. what the information on there says. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, you never know what the bees are carrying that year because some, you know, some years we won't see it at all. And like, it was it 2014. I mean, it's like every tree, apple tree we had here that we planted that year got it. It's like, whoa. So it can be real troublesome. Some stems on the bees in the neighborhood and, and the other pears and apples. You know, there's ornamental pear trees that get far away really easily. In fact, I think all the ornamental pear trees on Tustin Avenue they have fire blight on them, so we always have to keep an eye on our trees. Okay, so fire blight is the main disease that they get, and that's about, well, okay, so they also also get codling moths. The codling moths are the ones, the apple moth, or the apple worm. There's more than one apple worm, but we haven't seen the apple maggot. We've seen the codling moth. So codling moth uh, flies around when the fruit are fairly mature and lays eggs on them. And uh, you get a worm to go. You can see the worm and pears get it too. But uh, in most cases, it's where the apple or the pear touches something else. So the codling moth has to hide its eggs. So they usually hide them where either the two fruit are touching each other or where the fruit is touching another branch. So you'll find where two fruit are touching and you pick them and both of them have holes right where they're touching going into the fruit. That's where the moth hit the eggs. So if you 
first thing, first line of defense is make sure, like when they bloom, each one of these buds usually has about five to seven flowers in it, up to nine, in fact. Uh, so when they bloom and set their fruit, you have to wait till they're set because they abort a lot of these flowers. And when the fruit's about the size of your thumbnails, that's when you know, okay, the fruit's going to make it. If I have more than one on this branch close together, cut all but one off. Make sure they have room to form without touching the next fruit. And, you know, there's a lot of flower buds close together on this branch. There's here four of them. So that this can be a cluster of 12 fruit. You only want one in that cluster so that they don't touch another fruit. Then you don't have to worry about the uh, codling moth as much. But there's a few apples we've seen that will get codling moths, even if you make sure the fruit doesn't touch. Uh, um, Mutsu and Jonagol would get apple worms, even but most of the other apples would not get the apple worms if we thin them out. The other way to stop apple worms, if you don't like to thin, is to hit them with spinosad, which is an organic spray that kills uh, caterpillars for about a two week period. So every two weeks from the time they're bigger than a golf ball to the time they mature, you're to, that's what the orchards do. They, they spray their trees. Well, I, they may not be using organic products like this. They might have a spray that lasts longer, but we're gonna spray something, we're gonna use something organic. But yeah, if you thin them out, you, you generally don't get worms. The other way that's been done, before they had this, the organic farms would put a little paper bag around each fruit. And in Japan, they put a little silk stocking around each fruit. Keep the bugs off because they don't recognize bags or cloth as being the fruit they want to lay in. The one had soap in it, right? All right, this has soap, sticks a little better. Than so that. if I mix in my own with straight, my straight spin is that I could just add some soap. Um, just soap or uh, one of the dish soap. Yeah. So to know, um, you have to know the right amount or figure out the right amount. So if you don't add soap to a product, a lot of times it just beads yeah. up and won't spread out or it drops off because it's of you know, surface tension. If you add the right amount of soap, it spreads out and covers the whole object. If you have too much soap, it runs. It won't stick at all, it just runs right off. So generally it's about, for most soaps, are relatively the same concentration, about 10 drops per gallon of water. But depends on your soap. Is that easy wet the same, uh, have the same purpose? That product easy wet? That's to make the ground absorb water faster. Okay, different water. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to. We ordered a good wetting agent. I have a wetting agent up there right now, but it causes some issues with plant roots. Like it makes roses look really weird, it makes tomatoes look really well. It doesn't hurt citrus at all. So we're trying to get a better wetting agent that doesn't have that effect. It's been hard. Our suppliers do not carry wedding agents very much. They don't make much money on this. Okay, so training these. Um, so this we don't train because we don't have room in the store. So if you have an apple or pear, generally they tend to do that form where all the branches want to become. So if you let an apple or pear just grow naturally, they tend to do that. And because of that, only the very tip leaves have a lot of sunlight. So they tend to develop flower buds only at the tips of each branch. You still get a lot, but you get a lot more if you got the branches to lay out perfectly horizontal. That's why they do the spelling. And in other orchards where they grow them as trees, they're trained as Christmas tree form. So you have a tier of branches, you know, a couple feet off the ground. Foot above that, another tier of branches. Above that, another tier of branches. This is like Christmas tree. Shorter branches as you up the tree. But as when you lay these out, they develop their flower buds a lot better on short branches. So, you know, so each branch tip in the fall gathers energy and makes flower buds. Now, if you lay this down, they start doing a lot of short branches, like this is a short branch right here. They start doing that all along the stem. And each short branch has leaves and the flower buds develop on the end of it. So you get a lot of 
of apple production toward the center of the tree, the tip flowers make apples that tend to sunburn. So if you don't lay off your branches, you get a lot, you still get apples, but a lot more sunburn because they're out, out here exposed on the end. Whereas uh, if you lay these branches down, they'll be more protected from the sun. So the uh, apples and pears do this naturally to let them go really tall. So in the old days, you know, they let these things grow 20, 25 foot long branches, and finally the weight of that would just bring it horizontal. And then they would start being more productive. So in the old days, you know, we had to let apples and pears grow, 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 and then they would just naturally do this. But we know now that that's, you know, that took a long time. And uh, the tree is not very efficient. So if you have to keep it smaller and just pull the branches down horizontally, and get more fruit. So the ideal size about five foot wide, say eight foot tall, tiered branches. The nice thing about apples is each little fruiting spur can live 10 years or more. So you don't have to, you can have the same structure for a long, long time. Whereas on pear trees, you gotta renew the branches every year to get good food on them. Apple trees, same branch, pear trees, same branch for a decade. You said pull them down. Do you weight them to get them started to train them? Weight them or tie them or put stakes around them, some some way. Yeah, get them to lay flat. When they're, you know, if you, this is like three years old, so if it was younger, it'd be a lot easier just to pull them down, like just these branches. And... Yeah. I bought some spreaders. They're plastic. Mm -hmm. They have little points on them. So when you put them in, it actually sticks into the wood. Is that going to be bad? <laughs> Well, uh, again, apple prepares heal really well. Okay, because it's working good to spread them. Yeah, that was concerning. Yeah, now when you spread it down, would you cut the tips? Try to keep it five feet. Or... Yeah. Well, yeah. If you if you lower branch to horizontal, it won't grow. So you can see on this espalier here, in order for them to grow this long branch, they had to keep the tip pointed up. If it's pointed up, it still grows. But you lay it perfectly horizontal. It just stops growing. That's that's how plants work. When, well, not all plants, but most plants, when their branches are below horizontal, at horizontal below, they stop growing that way, and they start sprouting this way. So on this espalier, what will happen? You tie this down. You start being getting all these branches coming up that want to be another trunk. So what you have to do on this, once you have this, is clip these off about. Four, well, they will sit up to six inches long. I would say it looks better, like two or three inches. Just keep clipping them all summer. Just keep clipping them. In the fall, they'll stop growing and form a flower bud right at that level. And in a few years, they'll stop trying to grow into a trunk. They'll just stay and be a fruiting spur at that point. So. I mean, one of the elegant ways they do parasalliers. They make the tree look like this. Along long walls, we've seen this form. <laughs> That's probably not very efficient, but it certainly looks kind of neat. Yeah. Now, the other way to do an espalier uh, or an apple. So in the US, especially a long time ago, they had apple hedges. So they either train them this way or they just set the trees in the ground at an angle about three feet apart. We would set them in the ground like that and then go branches this direction. Which is probably a little more natural for the tree to do this than it is to do something totally horizontal. So they would just go up we'll head with that one. That's another option. Yeah. Yeah. Now all our apple trees are on semi dwarf root stock. There's a couple that we usually get. M111 from England and M7 are the two that are used. Uh, they don't dwarf them too much. Uh, there are some apple rootstocks like M9, I think, or M6, or some other ones that keep the trees really small. But they said the disadvantage of those, and the reason they don't recommend it for Southern California, is they need really wet dirt. And they need to be supported by a stake all their lives. They, they're not strong enough to stand up. 
whereas uh, M111 and M7 are not as bad with drought. They're still not good with drought, but they're not as bad with drought, uh, and they will stand up on their own. So, so generally with apples, they you know, bear their fruit on what made leaves last year. So all this new growth that comes out this year, they can grow, you know, they can grow three or four feet a year easy. Um, during summer, you just pluck it off. You don't need that. So put it in the summer, no? Well, you can put it in winter too, but you don't want to prune during spring. So during spring, they're putting all their energy into the flowers, the fruit, the new growth. They're at they're at their lowest energy level of the year. You don't want to do much pruning because they have they can't heal the wounds quite as well as they can in summer, fall, or winter when they have more energy storage. So, but you know, by summer they'll have grown, especially the young trees will have grown three feet. You don't want that growth to cut it off. They'll grow again during the summer and then toward fall, right when fall starts to do your final cut. In the fall, they don't grow much. They'll grow a little bit, but pretty much they're they're done for the year and then whatever you left they'll develop flower buds at the tips of each branch. So so in other words you don't want to do your pruning in winter for height control because the flower buds are now up there and you just cut them off. That's what I did the first back in the 80s I had a Gordon apple tree which is pretty lousy variety or mediocre I wouldn't, I wouldn't say lousy but mediocre variety. But it used to grow 10 feet every year. And the book says, well, you every winter you cut it to an outside bud so it forms an open base. So every year I cut the same 10 feet off my tree and got no fruit. Okay. And after five years, I said, this thing's never going to fruit. Pulled it out. That was my first experience with apple trees. Then we learned, oh, I was supposed to let that thing be real long and then open up on its own. Now I know, yeah, just pull the branches down. Don't, don't let them grow straight up. Questions on care, I think. About on care. So, Gary, right now the, the pear tree gets flowering. Don't prune it now. You can prune it now, when the, but once the leaves start really pushing forth, it's it's used up. It's using up all its energy reserves. Okay. When it's blooming, it's not really using too much yet. But yeah. Be safe. Don't prune until something. <laughs> thinning it out inside would be a next step as opposed to laying down the branch. Because you lay down the branches, and if you're not doing, watching that thing every day, I mean, it's going to, it almost, so it's overwhelming. Well, you have to hold them down somehow. Yeah. So either time down, but then sticks. something else grows and it's growing up. Well, I mean, it's 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 an overwhelming task, at least on the pear tree that I have. It just goes nuts. That's true. <laughs> so just thinning it out inside might get some light. In well, there. You, yeah, you want to you want to create these pruning spurs. So if you get enough light hitting the stems, yeah, you'll still develop like this tree because it's so small. The sunlight still gets here. You're still developing a lot of pruning spurs. Okay. So we're not really, if you wanted your maximum crop, lay the branches down, but you'll still get probably enough fruit without doing that. But if you want to keep them small and have a big crop at the same time, you know, lay your branches sideways. But, get, but at the better. beginning, you said we're not going to get a big crop anyway, because mm -hmm. you seem to be very negative about whether yeah. these pears are going to actually fruit. Yeah, this one made about 12 pears last year. Oh, not okay. bad. They were they were about that big. Okay, well that's pretty good. So that's pretty good for this. This okay. is only this it was only uh two years old last year. Now it's three years old. What variety is that? Posu. So we were really jazzed when we got fruit. And that is the top rated Asian pair. So anyway, we'll talk about that. But so on the apples, what's interesting is that we didn't really carry many apples before 1980 because we didn't think they would grow here. And we had two, we had Beverly Hills apple, which was really lousy. And we had the Gordon apple. Uh, the, both those were found locally, but they were fairly mediocre apples. They're not on anyone's, you know, highly rated set chart. So in about late 80s, we had heard about the Anna apple from Israel. 
And we started looking into that. And then someone brought me a bag of apples they, from their house in Midler and Miguel. And they said, you got to grow this thing. Rayburn apple. And it was really good. We're going, boy, we had never thought about growing apples before. And then so over the years, we started carrying apples. One by one, we'd carry a, a different apple to see what it would do. And every single one of them made fruit. So this number of years ago, Dave Wilson, who grows all these, you know, they have their catalog, they have about 40 or 50 varieties of apple trees. So they planted everything in their catalog, they said, in Irvine at the field station there. And all but two made commercial quality fruit. And they were just amazed too. They said, yeah, these apples rated at 1,500 hours of chill are still made fruit. The only one that didn't make only two that didn't make good quality fruit, Liberty and Honeycrisp. Unfortunately, Honeycrisp. So that's unfortunate because everybody likes Honeycrisp, but Honeycrisp ripens in August, and that's the problem. So when we, we carried Honeycrisp for over 10 years, and we were determined to get fruit. It fruited, but it always woke up for us in July, and the harvest period was August. So, you know, they got... On average, they got that big. They tasted fine. You know, it was the right flavor, but that's the only size they can do because they didn't have enough time before harvest because they bloom so late. So uh, now we had a real cold year, colder this year in 2008. And the Honeycrisp apples that year got that big. That's the biggest we ever got them because that was a really cold winter spring. Um, and they woke up in June. <laughs> they woke up in June instead of July and got, got to uh, a small size. So we don't recommend Honeycrisp and that's only one, unfortunately. I mean, if you ask Dave Wilson and say, oh, they produce well here, they just don't get any size. So, so every year we get a few more different apples to try. This year we got an ash meats kernel. Now, I had grown Spitzenberg in the past, so I ordered some, I don't know if I'm gonna get them, but Spitzenberg is another apple from, Spitzenberg's from New York. Ash meat kernel is from England, Spitzenberg is from New York. Both really good, spicy, sweet apples uh, that do quite well. But the apples we carry generally, uh, now, Anna is really unusual, and North says golden. So these two apples, and there's another one that we don't carry called Einschmier. Well, something like that. I was told by someone, a Jewish person, um, Einschmier. And it's an ice mirror from Israel. They don't seem to need much chill, so they always are, they're, they're blooming right now. This is warm enough for them to bloom in February. Dorset Golden is from the Bahamas, so someone spit out a golden bush to see the Bahamas, and Dorset Golden came out. It blooms at the same time as those two. So, um, and they make fruit, like these two make fruit in June, this makes fruit in July. These two, we haven't molded too much because June here is so cloudy often that these apples remain very tart, not enough sweetener. Whereas Anna seems to be a really good quality apple for us. So we do like the Anna. Um, now, they recommend Anna be pollinated by these and these be pollinated by those. But um, in my house, I pulled out my Dorset because I didn't like it enough to have it. And the Anna, Without the pollinator, uh, the fruit turned out not as shapely. So if you have a pollinator around, each apple has all seeds, you know, all the little seed pockets are filled with seeds. You know, that's like five or six seeds in each apple. When we pulled out the dorset, we opened the Anna, like one seed, that's all the apple had. So the apples were tend to be flat side on the opposite side where there's no seeds. So your crop is a little bit smaller due to that, the apple not being quite filled out enough. But we didn't, you know, we thought, oh, it's still making great apples. I'm not going to put the dorset back in. So 
So apple orchards always have pollen there to make sure they get full complement of seeds, but it doesn't seem to be essential to get some fruit. I mean, we, we know Donegal is totally self infertile, but we've seen it single trees make plenty of fruit. Maybe they are totally seedless, I don't know, but they're making fruit. So don't need a pollinator, although if you want your best fruit, have a pollinator that works. Now these three bloom early, so they won't pollinate the other apples. The other apples bloom late. So these three bloom around February, all the other apples tend to bloom um, between May and July. So they say if you're up in Oregon, each apple variety has a two week window for blooming. So they have to make sure they have the right apples next to each other, like Fuji and Gala will bloom at the same time. So these are the pollination partner. In Southern California, they all bloom, all the rest of the apples bloom for two months because they can't figure out when spring starts. So they said it's extended bloom. You you don't really have to pay attention to Fuji, Gala, Granny Smith, whatever apples you throw in there that are the late bloomers, they'll work. Except for honey crisp, of course. Yeah. So. And these three apple trees also tend to make their second crop fine because the first crop soft by July and they have time to make that second crop. Whereas the other apples don't have time to make a good second crop. And Anna, which a lot of people tell us Anna. They can harvest at least one apple every month of the year because the tree just doesn't seem to follow the seasons as well. Now, Anna is a shape like a red delicious. These two are shaped like yellow delicious. Anna is shaped like it's real tall. It's a very large apple. Uh, crispy, just sweet, just hints of tartness. So it's actually pretty close to honey crisp. The problem with the early apples, they have no hang time and no shelf life. So most apples, you can leave them on the tree for a month or two months, nothing happens to them. For Anna, you, we pick it when it's three quarters red. If it's totally red, it's already starting to get a bit mushy. And once you pick it and put it on your countertop, two days it's mush. So it doesn't have any shelf life. However, you can, like a lot of people found out, you can put it in Ziploc bags, Push the air out of there, zip the clothes, put in the refrigerator, two months storage, no problem. So it stores well in a Ziploc bag in the refrigerator. I would imagine it would even store in a Ziploc bag out of the refrigerator because the thing that makes them ripen is oxygen. So, you know, one of our customers says, well, you take a little straw and you put it in the corner of your Ziploc bag and you, you, uh, you suck all the air out of it. And then zip it close so there's no hardly any air in there and the apple won't won't uh, ripen any further. So what they do commercially is they store apples in um, containers where they suck out, well they put carbon monoxide in there. Carbon monoxide is the opposite, so it pushes the reaction the opposite way so they don't ripen. And they cold, you know, they said they can hold Fuji apples that way for 18 months. So some of the Fuji apples at the store are starting to <laughs> and Granny Smith up to 12 months. Those are the two best. Now, you know, like in the 1700s, 1600s, you grew storage apples. You didn't grow these apples we have. You grew the apples that stored well. It's like Mutsu apple is a typical storage apple. You cannot eat it off the tree. Off the tree, it's rock hard. You have to put it in a paper bag with a bunch of other apples and let it sit for a month. And then it gets a little softer, but uh, they need that storage to have something fresh to eat in the middle of winter. So that was, the, you know, so apples were very important to uh, to early man because it was one of the few fresh things you can eat all throughout the winter. So, so storage apples were the key back then now, and side, storage and cider apples, now we want dessert apples if I can faster. Okay, so these these two we carried around at horses for the year, and we have um they ripen early in the year, they're the early apples. The first of the rest of the season would be gala that ripens in August. It does store fairly well, as you well know. Um Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> then store as well as the other apple. So anyway, Gal is the first next one to ripen, and then you have Johnny Gold. Johnny Gold in back in the age was considered the best tasting of all the apples. It is really good. It's really big too. It ripens uh September. And then we have uh a bunch of apples that are ripening pink pearl. Now pink pearl is interesting. It's a apple that has kind of a pinkish flesh in it, uh very pink. It's slightly more tart than Anna, but it's not, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty people like and and they certainly the inside signage. Now there is this one was developed in California by Luther Burbank, who invented the Burbank potato. Um there's another apple that we're trying to get a hold of called Crimson because it's really dark red inside. My daughter apparently bought one of those from somebody. That was developed in England. Wait, pink pearl, um, September. And then you have um Fuji. September, October, and you can leave them on a tree way longer than that. And then it would be uh Brady. Yeah. Now it's actually gonna be well, all the rest of the apples tend to write in length. You have Brayburn. Brain Smith. Pink Lady. And Sundowner. Now, all four of those plus Yellow were developed down under. I mean, uh, New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia. And uh, these apples tend to be our best apples. Now, Granny Smith is interesting. It's from Sydney, Australia. And I thought, God, it must be in a mountain in Sydney somewhere. But no, they showed a picture of the right where it was found. It was uh, at that sea level. In Sydney, Australia, which is the same latitude as Mott's up on that, so they said they grow Granny Smith apples right next to pineapple. Right? So, Granny Smith, even though it likes chill, it's supposed to be uh, descended from a French crab apple, which makes its skin really sticky. But, um, you know, it doesn't need the cold. Pink Lady and Sundowner were developed by Mr. Cripps down in Perth, Australia, which is the same latitude as Orange County. So these apples do really well here. We're sold out of Sundowner. Unfortunately, we only got less than half the ones that we've not been ordered. So we have Pink Lady, and you know, Pink Lady, that's a good apple, and that's very sweet and very tart at the same time. Now, Granny Smith is interesting because, you know, if in Oregon they pick them October, um here you can leave them on the tree till February. So by Christmas time they start turning yellow. And by January they're bright yellow, well, not too bright yellow, but bright yellow and really fragrant. So my neighbor's Granny Smith tree, I, I, I used to remember on New Year's Day, I could smell out their apple trees from my front yard. Fragrance that coming off of Granny Smith was so powerful. It stays crispy, but it turns yellow and becomes sweet. No longer a tart apple. So I'm not sure if they eat it that way in Sydney, Australia. Maybe they just let it turn yellow. When you grow it in, in, in Oregon, it's green and tart. But uh, it's almost a different apple, a totally different apple by January here. See the apple? Lower on your list, pollinators, like the ones that are top three? No apples seem to need pollinators, but they're all health by. I mean, again, it's I think it's a seed count thing. More seed, better looking fruit. Blueberries, they say the same way. Blueberries, make, the blueberries we carry make all their fruit without pollinators, but if you have a pollinator, the fruit gets bigger. The berries get significantly bigger. Apples, I'm not sure if it's that significant or not. 
the gray burn off a good apple too. And those all these hang well onto, I think Alan says he has his sister has a tree, Brayburn tree down in Point Loma or down in San Diego somewhere. And it's they just harvested the last one about a month, month ago in January. The left out the uh, Arkansas black. And wine sap are also late ripeners. Arkansas black and wine sap are closely related. We have both them out there. So all these are kind of toward November, December, January. So if, you, you know, if you have dorsal gold ripening in June, June through January, it's your, I, I, I would tell you, Granny Smith will hang on until February. So June through February, you can have apples if you want them. I think that's all the apples we've got out there. Um, well, we have that multi. So on the multi apples, there are some with Gordon on there. Or being a mediocre variety. And then we have on the six and ones, we have Macintosh, which is the only apple of that, of I, that I've never grown here. And then there's, I think, Gravenstein on it, which I have grown here. Gravenstein would come in in uh, September. I believe that's German. Sounds like a German name. Um, no, they're, they're small, but they're most of the Older apples tend to be small. Ash meets kernel, which we have a few out there too. And I don't recall when ash meets kernel ripens. Ripens early. So red, it says it ripens after Red Delicious. Red Delicious in my house was ripe in August. That's that's actually a little really apple. So uh, Ashley's kernel would be more in here. Yeah, it's so in the future, we'll bring in a few other apple trees, see how well they do here. I mean, there's, again, just about any apple works. Any questions on these? The very way Anna's the not know what's in right. I never dropped its leaves. Started starting to grow. Live in SMU and it's froze a few times. You can like strip its leaves. I like the or just want to do its thing. It yeah. seems slow that old leaves. Yeah. Figure so, it out. Yeah. Many of our cousins said they don't do anything to it. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's such a just weird. It's fine. Uh, and such a heavy producer that almost stunts the plant too. The main thing is keeping wet. I remember in '98, my 12 apple trees. You know, I I kept them on the same water regimen first those first seven years I had them, six or seven years I had them, and they were looking really ugly in '98 or '97. Thought, what's going on with my apples? They're all sick or something. And the next year we had 98 was when we had 35 inches of rain. It was gorgeous. You know, like had to step up the water. I wasn't keeping up with the water. Do you fertilize apple trees? Not much. They grow really well. I mean, I, I think I fertilized them the year I planted them, and after that, just left mulch on the ground. That was it. Well, in those days, you know, I didn't know much, so I, I had bunch about like this on the ground. I mean, there's an apple orchard up in, near, uh, in Washington that says they do uh, 18 inches of mulch. Stops all the weeds, don't have to fertilize. And they said they don't have to water anymore either. But real deep mulch does generate some moisture. Especially if you live in a humid place like Seattle, cool at night, humid, you get that moisture condensing. Okay, so pears, um, 
So there's, we grow two kinds of pears. We don't grow the true, you know, you well, you know, apples came from Eastern Europe, the Caucasus Mountains. Pears, the European pears came from that same region, probably further south, and then the Asian pears developed in China, uh, or evolved in China, and then the Japanese pears we care were developed in Japan, of course, but they were brought from China. Uh, so the true European pears have a real high chill requirement that we don't ever see the meat. The true Japanese pears have a fairly high chill requirement that we don't seem to meet too often. When they cross the two, they got pears that needed less chill, but were really lousy tasting. Like back in the 80s, we got this thing called an orient pear that was supposed to be half and half. Made lots of pears, didn't taste very good. So what they did is they took those half and half pears and recrossed them with with European pears. And they got pears that were very European with a lower chill requirement. So those are the hybrids we carry now are those that they taste like European. There's a little bit of Asian in them, but they um, but they have more of a European quality, which if you have if you've never eaten an Asian pear, Asian pears are are very crisp. But very tender and very juicy, as, as juicy as European pears are even juicier. But very, it's like to me, it's like eating shaved ice, but not as sweet as European pears. So European pears to Asian people are too sweet, just nauseatingly sweet. So, so my taste buds, I like the Japanese pears the best because they're not so sweet. Although, you know, I love commas pears, and I, you know, they're fine. But I love the Japanese pears because they're not so sweet, but they're very tender, very crispy at the same time, which is kind of unusual, I would say, like eating crushed ice. So, um, so very, very good. And um, so anyway, so the pears we sell are hybrids, or we're trying the Asians again because we had some people tell us that they're getting Asian, the Japanese pears quite well. So we decided a couple years ago to start carrying them again. And lo and behold, last year we had a wonderful crop on the Husui, which is the top rated Asian pears. Now, most Asian pears are shaped like this. There's a few that are shaped like this, but most of them are shaped like, like an apple. And this one's very round. Almost perfectly around. Hosui. I've seen Hosui at some grocery stores right now. I guess they keep them cold storage while they're coming from Chile or something down down under. But uh, I've seen some at the stores and they are really good. Um, and the European pears tend to be more shaped this way. So the pears we have, uh, let's go over the, the Asian pears. Here's the Asian ones. Was 20th century, which is sometimes, you know, I see this name, I don't know, it's funny in our catalog, we have 20th century and EG Seiki listed separately. On Japan, this means 20th century. <laughs> so I don't know if there are two different trees there or in this zone, the same tree with two different names or you know, have it listed twice. But they're yellow, uh, flat like this. Um, supposedly need 350 hours or more. And then we have Hosui, which is relatively new. That's why we decided to carry it. And last year we had a wonderful crop on it. So we're going, okay, this is interesting. We'll see if it does two years in a row or three years in a row. But this is a, a shape like that. It's brown. This is yellow. That one's kind of light brown. Uh, this one is better. Hosui is better. They ripen both in the summertime, August. I would say August. I think 20th century might be a little earlier. No. Let's see what they do in the Central Valley.
they have uh, Hosui ripening in August, 20th century ripening same time. August. Yeah, no, I don't want. In fact, uh, the other pair in our nursery ripen the same time. So, okay, so the hybrid pairs. Well, I don't know who's doing it at the moment. Just say no. We, I reordered some. We'll see if we get any this next 20th century. We have the hybrid pairs. We have uh, keepers. And we have uh, 10 of three. Southern Queen. Now these are actually half Asian. Tennessee is a cross between a pair called Tennessee, but I don't know the history of Tennessee if it's a hybrid or if it's just a pure European pair. But Tennessee plus Hosui made Tennessee, but the same breeder did the exact same cross and he got Southern King too. So these two are siblings. Um, they seem to bloom and fruit at the same time as Hosui because that's their mom. So they would all make good pollination partners if you wanted to have them uh, quite safe, that is. And all three of these seem to make crops every year for us. I haven't eaten this one yet. Some keeps buying our tree. <laughs> and so I don't get, but I've eaten this one. I haven't eaten this one yet either, but we see them making fruit. But Tenosui and Southern King are more European shaped and more European flavor, those two. So these are developed in Texas. Because all the pairs we're selling this year. So in the pins, we've sold some hybrids called the uh, Hood and Florida Home. Those are both developed in Florida. Well, the home needed 400 hours, put on only 200 hours, so we quit carrying that one. Put is, is very prolific here, but you know, it's not as good as the ones we're carrying now. Is that the same as Hood River? Hood? Don't know, but it's called Hood. Okay. But it was developed in Florida. So. But I used to get hundreds of pears on my hood pear tree, and I didn't eat them. That's <laughs> like they were okay, but they're just weren't. You know, the stuff at the store was better than that. So I have a keeper, and coming on the third year, didn't bloom at all last year. So if it blooms this year, you want you get fruit, you want to taste it. Sure. <laughs> so the interesting thing about these two pears is you had to ripen them like a European pear. Which means, so European pears, if you, you know, sometimes the, the store you buy one, it's soft, and inside you open it up, it's all brown in the middle. It's called brown core. That means the, the farm picked them too late. So if you wait too long on a European pear to pick it, the inside is more ripe than the outside. So you, you're supposed to pick them when they just start turning a pale color, that pale color, and ripen them. At about, well, they say 68, but how warm room temperature is fine, 70, 72 degrees. You ripen at that temperature and they ripen evenly off the tree, but they don't, if you leave them on the tree till they're ripe, the inside is always too ripe. So the hood would do that on me also. It would, if you picked it too late, the inside would already be too ripe. This one did not do that. You can pick it off the tree ripe and it was fine. So it acts more like an Asian pear, which you can pick off the tree and eat. But European pears, the true European pears, you cannot leave them on the tree to ripen. They will be brown in the middle, brown core. Well, that leaves, okay. So one other thing goes on with apples and pears, similar to tomatoes, young trees tend to get, um, bitter pit on apples and pears. 
that's you'll see areas of the skin that are kind of shrunken down and darkened just like on a tomato you get that blossom end rod at the bottom shrinks down and turns black and that's from lack of calcium in the fruit so if they don't have enough calcium in the fruit they tend to get bitter pit because it's an area that didn't develop properly uh apples and pears both can get that on young trees now most most of them don't but some of the ones that make the really big fruits get it a lot so mutsu which make apples the biggest grapefruit and uh donegal would get that bitter bitter pit that it would self appear as a tree matured and got a bigger stems and bigger roots that would it, you, and you wouldn't have to treat it but uh it would have when the trees were young anyway so the and johnny gold such a big fruit so the ones that have bigger fruit tend to get it uh and when they're young they tend to get it as they get older they tend not to commercially what they do is spray calcium on the fruit not on the tree not on the not on the tree not on the dirt they would actually spray the developing fruit every week with the calcium spray to stop to make sure it didn't happen we do carry the calcium sprays here you just spritz the fruit once a week or so and it won't happen any other questions fertilizer mm -hmm. pears same way we didn't fertilize them much they they really tend to grow really well mm -hmm. so, so if we fertilize them, we just tend to use our all-purpose food tree fertilizer um there's some other disease that apples can get if it rains after they've leafed out. So we've only seen it happen on Anna because it leaves out real early and it's still raining. But you know, back in 95, it rained until May that year. And that's the only year we saw apple scab. So in Oregon, they're always fighting apple scab because they get rain a lot. But apple scab, the leaves of your apple trees get fuzzy black spots and the fruit get uh, irregular little small black specks all over the fruit and it ruins the fruit and it's it looks like black spot on rose and I'm thinking it's the same disease uh, but this will also stop that but we rarely get rain once they've leafed out and power and all that you rarely get rain so I saw that one year that's the only year I ever saw apple scab real bad but Oregon they fight that every year some trees are more susceptible to apple scab than others but that's one thing we don't have to worry and as the early apples are, are more sense are more susceptible because they come out early okay all right thank you thank you thank you